Okay, we have a pretty good one for this week. This is going to finish up our uh, study of uh, Justin Martyr's first apology. And it gets pretty interesting because he gives us a little glimpse of what Christians actually do at that time in the mid-2nd century. Uh, and, um, and also, we have to remember that his opinions are not necessarily representative of all of Christianity at that time. He was uh, in one of the enclaves in Palestine, of many enclaves of Christians that ne didn't necessarily know each other or uh, but they all were um, fostered by the Apostles so but they had some different opinions on different things so Justin Martyr is quite a unique individual he was a philosopher who became a Christian and he uh, equates everything from his past knowledge in philosophy to his n newfound knowledge in Christianity. And he, um, he claims that uh, the philosophers got their, some of their information from Moses and from the pro other prophets, uh, which he shows, which is pretty interesting. And he also talks about the demonology, that the demons are behind these fake um, counter-religions. So let's get started. And uh, I hope you like, share, and subscribe uh, if you want to see more videos like this. So this is where we left off, Chapter 54, Origin of Heathen Mythology. But those who hand down the myths which the poets now what's he mean by what's he mean by heathen mythology? He's talking about Greco Roman mythology. Uh, that's the the uh, status quo in his day. About what is he? About one thirty or one forty AD. Okay. But those who hand down the myths which the poets have made, Greek poets mostly, adduce no proof to the youths who learn them. And we proceed to demonstrate that they have been uttered by the influence of wicked demons to deceive and lead astray the human race. For having heard it proclaimed through the prophets that Christ was to come, and that the ungodly among men were to be punished by fire, they put forward many to be called sons of Jupiter, under the impression that they would be able to produce in men the idea that things which were said with regard to Christ were mere marvelous tales, like the things which were said by the poets. Okay, so if they made a bunch of wild and crazy um, prophecies, then the Bible would be seen as the same. And these things were said both among the Greeks and among all nations where they, the demons, heard the prophets foretelling that Christ would specially be believed in. But that in hearing what was said by the prophets, so he's talking about the prophets back in the, um, perhaps the 7th century B.C. Israel, right? So... They did not accurately understand it, but imitated what was said of our Christ. Like men who are in error, we will make plain. The prophet Moses then, which would be about, to, I think about 12 or 1300 BC in that area. The prophet Moses then was, as we have already said, older than all writers. Because even the book of Genesis was dictated by God to Moses. The book of Genesis is the only book known that was entirely dictated by God. Think about that. And by him, as we have also said before, it was thus predicted, There shall not fail a prince from Judah, 
nor a lawgiver from between his feet until he comes for whom it is reserved. And he shall be the desire of the Gentiles, binding his foal to the vine, washing his robe in the blood of the grapes. Genesis 49.10 Okay, let's take a look at this one here. This is, um, this is an excellent resource online I want to show you. It's called the Blue Letter Bible. Now, this here is the English version of the Bible. And I have chosen the King James Version. That's usually my favorite one to read. You can choose from a lot of different, different versions. All kinds of them. So you can pick whatever Bible you want. King James Version. Okay, so now, so this is the King James Version, and now what I can do, because I'm learning Hebrew right now, I'm um, almost at the level of a, a pastor now uh, um, in speaking or understanding Hebrew. And um, if you click on here on Tools, you see, God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's the King James Version. Click on Tools, and it breaks it down. There's the Hebrew of this verse. Vayomar Elohim Yehi Or Vayehi Or. So, and he said, Elohim, that's God, let there be light. And there was light. So, and you can click on any of these. See, this, this is, click on Elohim, okay? And there it is highlighted here, Elohim. And it tells you it's a noun. Um, gives you the Strong's number. You can look up the Strong's number. You click on it. It gives you the Strong's entry. Down here, it gives you the Strong's uh, definitions, legends, um, Strong's explanation for this word. Oh, this here is the Brown Driver Briggs lexicon, Hebrew lexicon. Gives you uh, definitions of Hebrew words. That's a very famous lexicon. And Jesenius is also a famous le lexicon. The Brown Driver Briggs is is derived from the Jesenius, and then uh, they also give you <clears throat> every verse where that Strong's number word appears. So there's, there's, there's a little overview of this website, and then I click back, back button, to get out of this and back to my, uh, my thing. And then if you want to get back just to the English, like if you scroll down, then you'll continue with the next verses in English. And if you want to close this, you just hit this X here. It'll close that Hebrew stuff. And you can open up the Hebrew or the Greek and New Testament into uh, any, any verse you want. So what was our verse we were looking for? Genesis 49.10. Okay. So that's what we're going to look up. Genesis. So now here's how you look it up. Right here is the books, this middle thing. Click on that. If you hit this, it's, uh, it goes to the next chapter. And if you hit this, it goes to the next book, to Exodus. But if we hit this middle thing, it shows every book in the Bible. So we pick Genesis, chapter 49, there, and now we go down to verse 10. Right here. The scepter. So this is what J J Jacob said about Judah. Judah are he who thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thy enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him? And then this is the one that uh, they they were that Justin Martyr was quoting. 
The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And what's Shiloh? Open up in the Hebrew. Shiloh is I think. Until Shiloh. Shiloh. So this is Shiloh. Shiloh. Till Shiloh comes. It's a proper name. What's the strong say about it? What it means is, in whose it is which belongs to him tranquility. Because it's related to shalom, shalom, peace, or tranquility, right? Shila. It's from the word shila, shala. Which is, click on that word, a primitive root. Okay, this is the verb, to be at rest, to prosper, to be quiet, to be at ease, to be at rest and prosper. Shalah. So from that verb, that primitive root, we hit the back button. Okay, we're at sh Shiloh, right? Shiloh. So that's from the word Shalah, to be at peace and be at rest. So if this is the noun. Uh, a proper name meaning him who is at rest or him who brings peace. It's an epithet of the Messiah, right? And it's also a proper location, a proper name. Shiloh was actually where the King Melchizedek was from, which is Jerusalem, right? It occurs two times in one verse, Shiloh, Shiloh, right here. Matches the Hebrew Shiloh, which occurs two times in one verse. That's interesting. Where's the other time? Let's take a look back. So we hit the back button up here, back. Uh, there's Shiloh, Shilah. I only see it one time. It only occurs one time in one verse. So until the the uh, noun of the the person who is named Peace. That's what Shiloh is. Nor a lawgiver from between the feet of Judah until a person named Peace. Well, who is the King of Peace? That's Jesus. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So, what's Justin Martyr saying? So, so Justin Martyr saying that the prophet Moses in the book of Genesis says uh, he predicted there not there shall not fail a prince from Judah nor a lawgiver from his between his feet until he comes for whom it is reserved and he shall be the desire of the Gentiles binding his foal to the vine washing his robe to the blood of grapes well, that would be the next verse, 49.11. Binding his foal to the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his te teeth white with milk. So it says, And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So Justin interpreted or translated that as uh, 
until he comes for and he shall be the desire of the Gentiles well does it actually say Gentiles let's see that would be goi in Hebrew until does it say goi up here the scepter lo shavat lo yasur that means it shall not depart shavat the scepter from me huda from judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until that which that which comes till he comes Shiloh and to him The gathering, what's the root here? Yakhat, the gathering, Am, Am means Amim, the peoples, the peoples. That's sort of um, Am, the word Am, right here, A M, Am, and Im is a plural. So it's a people. A people is a race. A race of people, basically. And uh, the, a people. A people. So that means the races. So it, you could interpret that as Gentiles. But that includes Jews. This is like all peoples. All peoples shall gather. So it's not just Gentiles, it's all peoples. If it was just Gentiles, it would say Goyim. Goy is a nation, Im, and that would sort of exclude Jews. Okay, so he goes on, The devils, accordingly, when they heard these prophetic words, said that Bacchus was the son of Jupiter, and gave out, that he was the discoverer of the vine, and they number wine, or the ass, among his mysteries. And they taught that having been torn in pieces, he ascended into heaven. And because in the prophecy of Moses it had not been expressly intimated whether he who was to come was the Son of God, and whether he would riding on the foul, whether he would, riding on the foal, remain on earth or ascend into heaven. And because of the name of foal could mean either the foal of an ass or the foal of a horse, they, not knowing whether he who was foretold would bring the foal of an ass or of a horse as the sign of his coming, nor whether he was the Son of God, as we said above, or of man, gave out that Bellerophon, a man born of man, himself ascended to heaven on his horse Pegasus. So they're talking about the Greek poets and, and Greek mythology, right? And when they heard it said by other prophet, Isaiah, that he should be born of a virgin, that's Isaiah, I think it's chapter seven fourteen. Um, and Isaiah would be about 700 B.C. And by his own means ascend into heaven, they pretended that Perseus was spoken of. And when they knew what was said, as has been cited above in the prophecies written before time, strong as a giant to run his course, they said that Hercules was strong and had journeyed over the whole earth 
And when again they learned that it had been foretold that he should heal every sickness and raise the dead, they produced Asclepius. So you see, so he's saying that if you check out these these poetries and these these mythical beings in the Greek poets, you will see that they come out after these prophecies came out, and you will find that they're trying to mimic and 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 uh, counterfeit what God is saying about the Messiah. Symbols of the cross. But in no instance, not even any of those called sons of Jupiter, did they imitate of being crucified. For it was not understood by them. All the things said of it, having been put symbolically. And this, as the prophet foretold, is the greatest symbol of his power and role as is also provided by the things which fall under our observation. For consider all the things in the world, whether without this form they could be administered or have any community. For the sea is not traversed, except that trophy, which is called a sail, abide safe in the ship. So if sea cannot be traversed without a sail, and the earth is not plowed, without it diggers and mechanics do not do their work, except with tools which have this shape. And the human form differs from that of the irrational animals in nothing else than its being erect, and having the hands extended, and having on the face extending from the forehead what is called the nose, through which there is respiration for the living creature, and this shows no other form than that of the cross. And so it was said by the prophet, The breath before our face is the Lord Christ. The breath before our face is the Lord Christ. Now if you sort of put that into... I don't... I don't I've never heard that before. It's interesting though because breath... In the, in the Hebrew language, breath is the same word as spirit, ruach. It's breath or spirit or wind. So the breath before our face is God, it's the spirit of God. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to Google this and see what happens. Lamentations 4.20. Let's take a look. Boom. Lamentations 4. Twenty. The breath of our nostrils, the anointed of the Lord, was taken in their pits of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the heathen. Our prosecutors, our persecutors are swifter than eagles of the heaven. This is when the Jews were taken into exile into Babylon. This is the lamentations that they were lamenting. Our, our, our persecutors are swifter than the eagles of heaven. They pursued us so the heaven is sky or heaven. So the eagles of the sky, swifter than the eagles of the sky, they pursued us among them upon the mountains. They laid wait for us in the wilderness. The breath of our no our nostrils, the anointed of the Lord, was taken in their pits. Oh, so it's saying we are the anointed of the Lord. The breath of our nostrils. The anointed of the Lord was taken in their pits. So the breath of our nostrils is the anointed of the Lord. So that's what he's saying, okay. Of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the heathen. The breath, see there it is, ruach, ruach. And it's breath. 
but we look at Strong's or other, um, it's breath, wind, spirit, uh, prophetic spirit. It's basically breath, wind, or spirit. It's a moving um, of air and or spiritual things. Because air itself is the physical manifestation of the Spirit of God. It's, it's the type of the symbolic uh, physical manifestation. And then we look at Strong's. Um, Jesenius is the oldest. It's a, a German guy. Spirit breath, breath of the mouth. The creative word, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. <clears throat> In the cool of the day, the cool of the day, Genesis 3 8. I didn't know that one. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. To, that that's prefix means to or by, by the, by the spirit of the day, by the wind of the day. So I guess that's an idiom that means the cool part of the day or the, the windy part of the day. Interesting. So, let's get back to our study. So, and so it was said by the prophet in Lamentations, the breath before our face is the Lord Christ. The Lord, the Spirit of God is what it said. Okay. And the power of this form is shown by our own symbols on what are called vexilla, banners and trophies with which all your state possessions are made, using these as the insignia, insignia of your power and government, even though you do so unwittingly. And with this form, you consecrate the images of your emperors when they die. Because a Roman banner was held on a pole, and there was a stick going across, uh, holding the banner. So they're saying you're. So he's saying you're holding this symbol, and you don't even know it. This cross symbol. You do so unwittingly, and with this form you consecrate the images of your emperors when they die, and you name them gods by inscriptions. Since therefore we have urged you both by reason and by evident form, and to the utmost of our ability, we know that now we are blameless, even though you disbelieve, for our part is done and finished. We have told you, in other words. The demons still mislead men, but the evil spirits were not satisfied with saying before Christ's appearance that those who were said to be sons of Jupiter were born of him, but after he had appeared and had been born among men, and when they learned how he had been foretold by the prophets and knew that he should be believed on and looked for by every nation, they again, as was said above, put forward other men, the Samaritans, Simon and Meander. So Simon is seen in the book of Acts as opposing Peter, Simon the magician, and Meander was another heretic. So it's, they were both Samaritans, who did many mighty works by magic and deceived many, and still keep them deceived. For even among yourselves, as we said before, Simon was in the royal city Rome in the reign of Claudius Caesar, and so greatly astonished the sacred senate and the people of the Romans, that he was considered a god, and honored like the others whom you honor as gods, with a statue. Wherefore, we pray that the sacred senate and your people may, along with yourselves, be arbiters of this, our memorial, 
in order that if any one be entangled by that man's doctrines, he may learn the truth, and so be able to escape error, and as for the statue, if you please, destroy it. Now that statue of Simon the Magician, I've heard people say that that's the statue of Peter in the Vatican on top of the big pole in the, in the, the in front of the Vatican, they have this huge uh, sacred pole with a statue of Peter on top. They say that's that statue. It's Simon Magus. Okay, and the demons cause persecution. Nor can the devils persuade men that there will be no conflagration for the punishment of the wicked, as they were unable to effect that Christ should be hidden after he came. But this only can they effect, the day who live irrationally and were brought up licentiously in wicked customs and are prejudiced in their own opinions should kill and hate us, whom we not only do not hate, but as proved pity and endeavor to lead to repentance. For we do not fear death, since it is acknowledged we must surely die, and there is nothing new but all things continue the same in this administration of things. And if statiety overtakes those who enjoy even one year of these things, they ought to give heed to our doctrines, that they may live eternally, free both from suffering and from want. But if they believe that there is nothing after death, but declare that those who die pass into insensibility, then they become our benefactors when they set us free from sufferings and necessities of this life, and prove themselves to be wicked and inhumane and bigoted, for they kill us with no intention of delivering us, but cut us off that we may be deprived of life and, pr and pleasure. So they kill us to take away from us. Yeah. And they raise up heretics. And as we said before, the devils put forward Mar Marcion and Pontus, who is even now teaching men to deny that God is the maker of all things in heaven and on earth, and that the Christ predicted by the prophets is his son, and preaches another God besides the creator of all, and likewise another son. And this man many have believed, as if he alone knew the truth, and laugh at us, though they have no proof of what they say, but are carried away irrationally as lambs by a wolf, and become the prey of atheistical doctrines and of devils. For they who are called devils attempt nothing else than to seduce men from God who made them, and from Christ his force begotten, and those who are unable to raise themselves above, above the earth they have riveted, and do now rivet, to things earthly, and to the works of their own hands. But those who devote themselves to the contemplation of things divine, they secretly beat back, and if they have not a wise sober-mindedness and a pure and passionless life, passionless life, they drive them into godlessness. So it's just the opposition from wicked people against Christians, okay? Plato's obligation to Moses. And that you may learn that it was from our teachers, we mean the account given through the prophets, that Plato borrowed his statement that God, having altered matter, which was shapeless, made the world. Hear the very word spoken through Moses, who, as shown above, was the first prophet and of greater antiqu antiquity than the Greek writers, and through whom the spirit of prophecy, signifying how and from what materials God at first formed the world, spoke thus. And he's saying Moses wrote Genesis. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was invisible and unfurnished, without form and void. Okay, it's interesting to hear his interpretation of those words. Those are very difficult words. 
uh, without form and void, invisible and unfurnished. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and it was so. So that both Plato and they who agree with him, and we ourselves have learned, and you also can be convinced, that by the word of God the whole world was made out of the substance spoken of before by Moses, and that which the poets call Erebus, we know was spoken of formerly by Moses. Deuteronomy 32.22 Let's see what that is. Deuteronomy 32.22 So we go here. Click on that. Deuteronomy 32. 22, down to 22. For a fire is kindled in my anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Oh. So I don't know what he's talking about there. So it's like what God said the world is made of. Uh, so that Plato um, said what Moses has already said. Okay, now Plato's doctrine of the cross. Hmm. And the phys physiological discussion concerning the Son of God in the Timaeus of Plato where he says he placed him crosswise in the universe, he borrowed in like manner from Moses. For in the writings of Moses it is related how at that time when the Israelites went out of Egypt and were in the wilderness, they fell in with poisonous beasts, both vipers and ass, and every kind of serpent which slew the people, and that Moses, by the inspiration and influence of God, took brass and made it into the figure of a cross and set it in the holy tabernacle and said to the people, if you look to this figure, so that was a serpent on a cross, okay, and believe you shall be saved. And when this was done, it was recorded that the serpents died and it is handed down that the people thus escaped death. When thing, which things Plato reading and not accurately understanding and not apprehending that it was the figure of the cross, but taking it to be a placing crosswise, he said that the power next to the first God was placed crosswise in the universe. And as to his speaking of a third, he did this because he read, as we said above, that which was spoken by Moses that the Spirit of God moved over the waters. For he gives the second place to the Logos, which is with God, who he said was placed crosswise in the universe, and the third place to the Spirit, who was said to be born upon the water, saying, and the third around the third. And hear how the Spirit of prophecy signified through Moses that there should be a conflagur conflagration. He spoke thus, Everlasting fire shall descend and shall devour to the pit beneath. In Deuteronomy 32.22 It is not then that we hold the same opinions as others, but that all speak in imitation of ours. Among us these things can be heard and learned from persons who do not even know the forms of the letters who are uneducated and barbarous in speech, though wise and believing in mind, some indeed, some indeed even maimed and deprived of eyesight, so that you may understand that these things are not the effect of human wisdom, but are uttered by the power of God. So now he's going to talk about Christian baptism. 
I will also relate the manner in which we dedicated ourselves to God when, when we had been made new through Christ, lest if we omit this we seem to be unfair in the explanation we are making. As many as are persuaded and believe that what we teach and say is true and undertake to be able to live accordingly are instructed to pray and entreat God with fasting for the remission of their sins that are past, we praying and fasting with them. Then they are brought by us where there is water and are, and are regenerated in the same manner in which we were ourselves regenerated. For in the name of God, the Father, and the Lord of the universe, and of our Savior Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit, they then received the washing with water. For Christ also said, Unless you be born again, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. John 3, 5. Now that it is impossible for those who have once been born to enter into their mother's wombs is manifest to all and how those who have sinned and repent shall escape their sins, is declared by Isaiah the prophet, as I wrote above, he thus speaks, Wash you and make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from your souls, learn to do well, judge the fatherless, and plead for the widow, and come and let us reason together, says the Lord. And though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them white like wool, and though they be as crimson, I will make them white as snow. For if you refuse and rebel, the sword shall be de devour you, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And that's Isaiah 1, 16-20. And for this right we have learned from the apostles, this reason. Since at our birth we were born, without our own knowledge or choice, by our parents coming together, and were brought up in bad habits and wicked training, in order that we may not remain the children of necessity and of ignorance, but may become the children of choice and knowledge, and may obtain in the water the remission of sins formerly committed. <clears throat> there is pronounced over him who chooses to be born again, and has repented of his sins, the name of God, the Father, and the Lord of the universe, he who leads to the laver, the person that is to be washed, calling him this name alone. For no one can utter the name of the ineffable God. And if anyone dare to say that there is a name, he raves with a hopeless madness. And this washing is called illumination, because they who learn these things are illuminated in their understandings, and in the name of Jesus Christ, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, in the name of the Holy Ghost, who through the prophets foretold all things about Jesus, he who is illuminated is washed. Interesting, eh? This is first century Christians living under the persecution. And the devils indeed, having heard this washing published by the prophet, instigated those who enter their temples and are about to approach them with libations and burnt offerings, also sprinkle themselves, and they cause them also to wash themselves entirely as they depart from the sacrifice, before they enter into the shrines in which their images are set. And the command too given by the priests to those who enter and worship in the temples, that they, took, that they take off their shoes, the devils, learning what happened to the above-mentioned prophet Moses, having given in imitation of these things. For at that juncture, when Moses was ordered to go down into Egypt and lead out the people of the Israelites who were there, and while he was tending the flocks of his maternal uncle in the land of Arabia, Interesting, he says right there, it's in the land of Arabia. Our Christ conversed with him under the appearance of fire from a bush and said, Put off your shoes and draw near and hear. Our Christ, did Jesus Christ conversed with him. And he, 
when he had put off his shoes and drawn near, heard that he was to go down into Egypt and lead out the people of the Israelites there. And he received mighty, mighty power from Christ, who spoke to him in the appearance of fire, and went down and led out the people, having done great and marvelous things, which you, if you desire to know, you will learn them accurately from his writings. That's the Exodus, right, from Egypt. <clears throat> and all the Jews even now teach that the nameless God spoke to Moses, whence the spirit of prophecy, accusing them by Isaiah the prophet, mentioned above, said, The ox knows his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know me, and my people do not understand. Isaiah 1.3 and Jesus the Christ, because the Jews knew not what the Father was and what the Son, in like manner accused them and himself said, No one knows the Father but the Son, nor the Son but the Father, and they to whom the Son reveals him. In Matthew 11.27 Now the word of God is his Son, and as we, as we have before said, and he is called an angel and apostle, for he declares whatever we ought to know, and is sent forth to declare whatever is revealed. As our Lord himself says, Hear the, He that hears me, hears him that sent me. From the writings of Moses also this will be manifest, for thus it is written in them. And the angel of God spoke to Moses in a flame of fire out of the bush, and said, I am that I am, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of J Jacob, the God of your fathers who go down into Egypt and bring forth my people. That's in Exodus 3, 6. And if you wish to learn, so the angel of God, the messenger, angel is, can also mean messenger. It's the same word. The angel of God, the messenger of God spoke to Moses in a flame of fire out of the bush and said, I am that I am, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Okay. <clears throat> and if you wish to learn what follows, you can do so from the same writings. That's uh, the book of Exodus. For it is impossible to relate the whole here. But so much is written for the sake of proving that Jesus the Christ is the Son of God and his Apostle, being of the old word and appearing sometimes in the form of fire and sometimes in the likeness of angels, but now, by the will of God, having become man for the human race, he endured all the sufferings which the devils instigated the senseless Jews to inflict upon him, who, though they have it expressly affirmed in the writings of Moses, and the angel of God spoke to Moses in a flame of fire in a bush, and said, I am that I am, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, yet maintain that he who said this was the Father and Creator of the universe. Once also the spirit of prophecy rebukes them and says, Israel does not know me. My people have not understood me. That's in Isaiah 1.3. And again, Jesus, so Isaiah was about 700 B.C. Moses was about 1200 B.C. or so. And again, Jesus, as we have already shown, while he was with them, while he was on earth as a man, no one knows the Father but the Son, nor the Son but the Father, and those to whom the Son will reveal him. The Jews, accordingly, being throughout of opinion that it was the Father of the universe who spoke to Moses, though he who spoke to him was indeed the Son of God, who is both called angel and apostle, are justly charged, both by the angel and apostle. So he's saying uh, angel and messenger, because apostle is the Greek word for messenger, right? So, bringer of good news, or so, angel, and it, and that that word is used even for a king sending a messenger, 
It's the same word. It just means messenger. So he's called the messenger or in, in Hebrew and he's called the messenger in Greek is what he's saying here. They are justly charged both by the spirit of prophecy and by Christ himself with knowing neither the Father nor the Son. So the Jews are charged with not knowing the Father or the Son. For they who affirm that the Son is the Father are proved neither to have become acquainted with the Father, nor to know that the Father of the universe has a Son, who also, being the first begotten Word of God, is even God. And of old he appeared in the shape of fire and in the likeness of an angel to Moses and to the other prophets. But now in the times of your reign, having, as we before said, become man by a virgin, according to the counsel of the Father, for the salvation of those who believe in him, he endured both to be set at naught and to suffer, that by dying and rising again he might conquer death. And that which was said out of the bush to Moses, I am that I am, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, and the God of your fathers. That's Exodus 3.6. This, this signified that they, even though they are dead, are yet in existence, and are men belonging to Christ himself, for they were the first of all men to busy themselves in the search after God, Abraham being the father of Isaac, and Isaac of Jacob, as Moses wrote further misrepresentations of the truth. From what has been already said, you can understand how the devils, in imitation of what was said by Moses, asserted that Prosperpine was the daughter of Jupiter and instigated the people to set up an image of her under the name of Kor, or Cora, the maiden or daughter, at Springheads. For as we wrote above, Moses said, In the beginning God made the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and unfurnished, or void. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In imitation, therefore, of what is here said of the Spirit of God moving on the waters, they said that Prosperpine, or Korah, was the daughter of Jupiter, and in like manner also they craftily feigned that the Minerva was the daughter of Jupiter, not by sexual union, but knowing that God conceived and made the world by the word, they say that Minerva was the first conception, which we consider to be very absurd, bringing forward the form of the conception in a female shape. And in like manner the actions of those others who are called sons of Jupiter sufficiently condemn them. Administration of the sacraments. But we, after we have thus washed him who has been convinced and has assented to our teaching, bring him to the place where those who are called brethren are assembled, in order that we may offer hearty prayers in common for ourselves and for the baptized person for all others in every place that we may be counted worthy, now that we have learned the truth by our works also to be found good citizens and keepers of the commandments, so that we may be saved with an everlasting salvation. Having ended the, the prayers, we salute one another with a kiss. There is then brought to the president of the brothers bread and a cup of wine mixed with water. And he, taking them, gives praise and glory to the Father of the universe through the name of the Son and the Holy Ghost and offers thanks at a considerable length for our being counted worthy to receive these things at his hands. And when he has, conducted, when he has concluded the prayers and thanksgiving, all the people present express their assent by saying, Amen. This word, Amen, answers in the Hebrew language, So be it. Aman means truth in Hebrew. Aman. So be it. And when the President has given thanks, and all the people have expressed their assent, 
those who are called by us deacons, give to each of those present to partake of the bread and wine mixed with water over which the thanksgiving was pronounced. And to those who are absent, they carry away a portion. So even those who are not there, they take them, they take it to their house for them, I guess. So there's uh, two sacraments, baptism and the, uh, the passion, the, the Holy Last Supper of the Eucharist. And this food among us is called the Eucharist, of which no one, no one is allowed to partake but the man who believes that the things which we teach are true. And who has been washed with the washing that is for the remissions of sins? So only the baptized. And unto regeneration. And who is so living as Christ has enjoined? For not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, but in like manner as Jesus Christ our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation, so likewise we have been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word and from which our blood and flesh by transmutation are nourished is the flesh and blood that Jesus, who was made flesh for the apostles in the memoirs composed by them, which are called Gospels, have thus delivered unto us what was enjoined upon them, that Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he said, Do this in remembrance of me. This is my body, and that after the same manner, having taken the cup and given thanks, he said, This is my blood, and he gave it to them alone, which the wicked devils have imitated in the mysteries of Mithras, commanding the same thing to be done, for that bread and cup of water are placed with certain incantations into the mystic rites of one who is being initiated. You either know and or can learn. So Mithras, that was a, a cult among Roman soldiers a lot. Mysteries of Mithras. So they took that, uh, that ceremony for themselves for initiation ceremony. Okay, interesting. So he's saying, okay, it's you could uh, deduce from this either uh, transmutation. Yeah. So our 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 by eating this, which is called the blood and flesh of Christ, our blood and flesh are nourished. By transmutation, well, of course, like any food is, right? Uh, but that's the part of the ceremony. So you could deduce either that it is symbolic that he's saying, or you could also des deduce that it is actually uh, what, it, like the Catholics believe, the uh, the actual becomes the body and blood of Jesus. Because the symbol is such a, it's a, such a powerful symbol. It's, uh, you could e think of it either way, I suppose. Now, and after we, afterwards, the weekly worship. Okay, here's another one. And afterwards, continually remind each other of these things. And that we, afterwards, after doing the, the ceremony, we continually remind each other of these things, and the wealthy among us help the needy, and we always keep together. For all things wherewith we are supplied, we bless the Maker of all through His Son Jesus Christ, and through the Holy Ghost. And on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together to one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read. As long as time permits, then, when the reader has ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. And we all rise together and pray, and as we before said, when our prayer is ended, bread and wine and water are brought, 
and the President in like manner offers prayers and thanksgivings according to his ability, and the people assent, saying, Amen. So according to his ability. So that, that is, um, that kind of says it's not always the same speech every week. That he offers prayers and thanksgivings according to his ability. And the people assent, saying, Amen. And then there is a distribution to each and a participation participation of that over which thanks had been given, and to those who are absent a portion is sent by the deacons, and they who were all well-to-do and willing give what each thinks fit, and what is collected is deposited with the president who secures the orphans and widows and those who through sickness or any other cause are in want, and those who are in bonds and the strangers sojourning among us, and in a word, takes care of all who are in need. But Sunday is the day on which we all hold our communion, common assembly, because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, on the same day rose from the dead, for he was crucified on the day before that of Saturn, Saturday. And on the day after that of Saturn, which is the day of the sun, having appeared to his apostles and disciples, he taught them these things, which we have submitted to you also for your consideration. So that's another interesting thing. Conclusion. And if these things seem to you to be reasonable and true, honor them. But if they seem nonsensical, despise them as nonsense. And do not decree death against those who have done no wrong, and as you would against, as you would against enemies. For we forewarn you that you shall not escape the coming judgment of God if you continue in your injustice. And we ourselves will invite you to do that which is pleasing to God, and through and though from the letter of the greatest and most illustrious emperor Adrian, your father, we could demand that you order judgment to be given as we have desired. Yet we have made this appeal an explanation not on the ground of Adrian's decisions, because we know that what we ask is just. And we have subjoined a copy of Adrian's epistle that you may know that we are speaking truly about this and the following is the copy. So this is Adrian's epistle. Epistle of Adrian on behalf of the Christians. So this was the emperor before these guys. I have received a letter addressed by me by your predecessor, Serenius Granianus, a most illustrious man, and this communication I am willing to pass over in silence, lest innocent persons be disturbed an occasion be given to the informers for practicing villainy. Accordingly, if the inhabitants of your prof province will so far sustain this petition of theirs as to accuse the Christians in some court of law, I do not prohibit them from doing so, but I will not suffer them to make use of mere entreaties and outcries, for it is far more just if anyone desires to make an accusation that you give judgment upon it. And if therefore anyone makes the accusation and furnishes proof that the said men do anything contrary to the laws, you shall adjudge punishments in a proportion to the offenses. And this by Hercules you shall give special heed to, that if any man shall, though mere, through mere Calmony, bring an accusation against any of these persons, you shall award to him more severe punishments in proportion to his wickedness. And there's an, ep an epistle of Antoninius to the common assembly of Asia. So this is Antoninius, the son. This is the one who received a letter from Justin Martyr, I think. Okay. 
the Emperor Caesar, Titus, Ilius, Adrianus, Antoninus, Augustus, Pius, Supreme Pontiff, this is the Emperor of Rome, okay, Supreme Pontiff, in the 15th year of his tribuneship, counsel for the third time, Father of the Fatherland, to the Common Assembly of Asia. Boy, it almost seems like the Book of Revelation again. <laughs> to the Assembly of Asia. Greeting. I should have thought that the gods themselves would see to it that such offenders should not escape. For if they had the power, they themselves would much rather punish those who refuse to worship them. But it is you who bring trouble on these persons and accuse, as the opinion of atheists, that, that which they hold, and lay to their charge certain other things which, are, which we are unable to prove. But it, would be advantageous, but it would be advantageous to them if they should be thought to die for that which they are accused. And they conquer you by being lavish of their lives rather than yield that obedience which you require of them. And regarding the earthquakes which have already happened, and are now occurring, it is not seemly that you remind us of them, losing heart whenever they occur, and thus set your conduct and thus set your conduct in contrast to that of these men, for they have much greater confidence towards God than you yourselves have, and you indeed seem at such times to ignore the gods, and you neglect the temples, and make no recognition of the worship of God and hence you are jealous of those who do serve him, and persecute them to the death. Concerning such persons, some others also of the governors of provinces wrote to my most divine father, to whom he replied that they should not at all disturb such persons, unless they were found to be attempting anything against the Roman government. And to myself many have sent imitations regarding such persons, to whom I also replied in pursuance of my father's judgment. But if anyone has a matter to bring against any person of this class, merely as such a person, let the accused be acquitted of the charge, even though he should be found to be such a one. But let the accuser be amiable to justice. So that's the emperor saying, the Supreme Pontiff, the Emperor, telling Asia not to persecute Christians just because they're Christians, but to rather let them be found to be, to have broken some law. And there's a epistle of Marcus Aurelius to the Senate, in which he testifies that the Christians were the cause of his victory. The Emperor Caesus, Marcus Aurelius Antonius, Germanicus, Parthicus, Samarticus, to the people of Rome and to the sacred senate, greeting. I explain to you that my grand design and what advantages I gained on the confines of Germany. With much labor and suffering, in consequence to the circumstance that I was surrounded by the enemy, I myself being shut up in Carnentum by 74 cohorts, nine miles off, and the enemy being at hand. The scouts pointed out to us, and our general Pomperinus joined us, and that there was a close on us, a mass of mixed multitude of 977,000 men, which indeed we saw, and I was shut up by this vast host, having with me only a battalion composed of the first tenth double and marine legions. Having then examined my own position and my host with respect to the vast mass of barbarians and of the enemy, I quickly betook myself to prayer to the gods of my country. But being disregarded by them, I summoned those who among us go by the name of Christians, and having made inquiry, I discovered a great number and vast hosts of them and raged against them, which was by no means becoming, for afterwards I learned their power. Wherefore they began the battle, 
not by preparing weapons, nor arms, nor bugles, for such preparation is hateful to them, on account of the God they bear about in their conscience. Therefore it is probable that those whom we suppose to be atheists have God as their ruling power entrenched in their conscience. For having cast themselves on the ground, they prayed not only for me, but also to, for the whole army as it stood, that they might be delivered from the present thirst and famine, for during five days we had got no water, because there was none, for we were in the heart of Germany, and the enemy's territory, and simultaneously, with our, their casting themselves on the ground and praying to God, a God of whom I am ignorant, water poured forth from heaven upon us, refreshingly cool, but upon the enemies of Rome a withering hail, and immediately we recognized the presence of God following on the prayer, a God unconquerable and indestructible. Founding upon this, then, let us pardon such are, as are Christians, lest they pray for and obtain such a weapon against ourselves. And I counsel that no such person be accused on the ground of his being a Christian. But if any one be found laying to the charge of a Christian that he is a Christian, I desire that it be made manifest that he who is accused as a Christian and acknowledges that he is one is accused of nothing else than only this, that he is a Christian, but, ha but that he who arraigns him be burned alive. And I further desire that he who is entrusted with the government of the province shall not compel the Christian who confesses and certifies such a manner to retract, neither shall he commit him, for I desire that these things be confirmed by decree of the Senate. And I command this my edict to be published in the Forum of Trajan, in order that it may be read. The prefect Viterus Polio, we will see that it be transmitted to all the provinces round about, and that no one who wishes to make use of or to possess it shall be hindered from obtaining a copy from the document I now publish. And that's it. End of the first apology of Justin. I know it was quite a marathon, but we did learn quite a bit here, didn't we? Of uh, the, the early Christians and what made them. And here's the, the Christians are, are doing baptisms and the Eucharist as the two sacraments. And the Roman emperor is the pontiff. Think about that. So that was it about uh, the last of Justin Martyr's videos. And I like the ending with the, the Roman emperor testifying about Christians and how much powerful how much power they had to save his army. Um, that is not a Christian talking, that's a, an atheist talking, or a Roman, Roman emperor talking. He was a general at that time, he later became an, em an emperor. And uh, it was interesting what Justin Trudeau talked about the cross, where you see the cross everywhere. It's, uh, you can't sail a ship without having a cross to hold the sail. You can't plow a field without having a cross shape to hook the plow to the horse or the oxen. Um, they, the Roman soldiers use a cross to hang their banners from while on the end of a pole. So that was uh, kind of interesting. It was kind of the old world thinking, very old world thinking. Um, some people say to the cross today, like, I don't really use crosses as a Christian. Um, I, it's, it, to me, it's more of an icon. And uh, maybe, I don't think God minds too much if, if that symbol appeals to the masses. But it's not really needed by God to do anything. Um, and Justin also talked about the bat baptism and the Eucharist, the only two sacraments that they had at that time, the only two sanctioned by Jesus. 
and uh, and the other interesting thing I found was the the pontiff was the Roman emperor, and I know about that. They uh, they had what was called the College of Pontiffs, and he uh, named himself as the Supreme Pontiff. So the lesser pontiffs, each pontiff is a, is in charge of a god to make sure that that god or set of gods is happy. So there's a pontiff of Zeus, a pontiff of Jupiter, a pontiff of Mercury, or any Roman gods. And um, the supreme pontiff is the emperor where he's in charge of all the other pontiffs. It was called the College of Pontiffs. And the Roman Catholic Church adapted that structure for themselves. I guess when the Roman Emperor moved to Constantinople in Rome, the the popes took up the mantle of the name of Pontiff um, or Supreme Pontiff, as uh, giving themselves authority over other Christians and over even over the uh, pagans. So it's interesting stuff when you look at that kind of history. And you learn a little bit more about, uh, you know, the, these Christians from the early 2nd century, they weren't like all-knowing Christians. It was just a guy that, that was his experience. And it was quite interesting to see probably third generation from the apostles on what his experience was with the church where he was. So, um, thank you for watching and we will see you in the next video.